Hello and welcome to the rest is football question and answer episode with Micah Richards, Alan Shearer and me, Gary Lineker. Thank you once again for sending in your questions. Uh, some really good ones this week. I, I think you'll agree, chaps. Um, let's start with Harry G. My question is about TV cameras. Are you aware of the TV cameras when you're playing or do you forget as soon as the whistle goes? And does it make you or others you've played with play better, worse when you know you're playing live on TV? Um, <laughs> hardly any games I played were on live on TV back then. It was quite rare that you'd see yourself on on television. Um, it was quite a big thing just to appear on Match of the Day because they only used to kind of one or two games highlights back then. Yeah. Um, World well, Cup's different. You you know you're you're. I don't think you think about that at all. I don't. I I, I agree. I just think once that uh, you you might be you might you're, you're aware of it before the game, but once that whistle kicks off, and the last thing you're thinking about, or I was anyway, was about TV cameras or this game's on TV or whatever it is. You just you just yeah. got to go out and do what you. Have I don't to know. Do, I think so. Micah might be different on this one because of course. <laughs> When the cameras, lights, camera action, I'm ready to go. I know exactly what's happening. I made my, I scored my um, goal against Villa in the FA Cup when I was 17. That was on TV. Yeah. What else did I do? Dropped the F word in the in the, yes, we had in the, the post match interview. Um, 18 <laughs> made my debut for England. That was on TV. Every game, every big moment I've had in my life has been... Well, you've, you, you've played in the era when pretty much all games are televised in some way, shape or form. But it depends. So be, as you get older and stuff, you, well, you know about match of the day all the time. But when I was young, you know, you pundits and you presenters. So I, when I talked about it, I came on the scene early. I could do no wrong. Did you? You never mentioned but it. But then there was a period where I wasn't playing so well. And because I was English, I think you guys let me get away with it. But as soon as you get to 21, 22, 23, oh my, that's when you're thinking, oh, match of the day tonight. Please, please, <laughs> Alan, Gary, Wrighty, do not, do not slander me, please, on, <laughs> on TV. So the older you get, you definitely think about, oh, please, match of the day. Oh, so you, you used to try and play better because the TV cameras or you're on a live game. Is that what you're saying? When, when I was younger, when I was younger, I was like Victory Shield. When I was under 16, <laughs> I scored on TV as well. <laughs> All the big moments come on. It's just, I don't know. Uh, it's something about the camera just, we have a great relationship, you know? Did you used to get your head cut prop before? Okay, oh, yeah, see, see, that's what takes oh, me to, you. Uh, to uh, Kid knobhead, you did as well, didn't you? <laughs> you did as well, didn't you? <laughs> but the, the, the trims were different back then, you know. The, the, the trims are like HD now, you know. But but back then, yeah, I got I got butchered. You had few. you had you had quite. I, I remember that interview. You had, you had like little swizzles. Yes, things, I used you? to have like a, a side part, a, a, a swizzle. Oh, I had all sorts of trims when I was young, but yeah, that a swizzle, a little what swizzle, the yeah. Fuck's a swizzle. <laughs> a little, I, I don't know, like a little. I think it's a salty snack, isn't it? <laughs> swizzle. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to Mike's answer to the next question. Actually, oh. from Danny, with the dedication needed to become a professional footballer, what sacrifices did you make in your own lives? <laughs> To allow you to to give everything to football in order to make it. Oh, Look at what God. sacrifices! <laughs> <laughs> these are jokes. These are people. These are jokes. These are jokes. I've stepped into character of big beaks now. I'm not. I, it was yes. It was banter. That's all it was. <laughs> so, do you guys want to go first, or we'll give the we'll give the professional answers, shall yes. we? Go on, Al. The sacrifices. What? Christmas, New Year, birthdays. Um, summer holiday or ev everything that's but they're all worth it because of the life you have weekends weekends yeah yeah but, but is it worth it that, of course it's worth it to be a footballer I'm not saying that that, that sounded ridiculous but you, don't you think you miss out on a lot of the social side so I'm talking you didn't well I didn't but you, you guys outside of football because you're just like a robot you go to training 
you you know your boots are there for you, your kit's there for you, you get like a family there, and everyone outside of that bubble is like outsiders, so you miss the real social side. I'm not just talking about going out and drinking or whatever. I'm talking about just you know family, you know, and making the effort to to see people and all. I think it just goes out the window. I, I never felt like a sacrifice though. Did it? it was just no, but some, not a sacrifice. Yeah, not a sacrifice. just doing something that. that, that are, you know, do you know what the hardest part I think is, guys? Is after you've been like now, like knees and back and ankles and all of that. It's like yeah, that's. You know, you're training every day and you're playing and you're injured. And that, mm. that, that's what you feel most when you retire. Or for me, anyway. Yeah, well, talking about retiring and stuff like that, that leads me on to the next question from Freddie Webb. Was there ever a moment in your career where you were going through a really bad period and you wanted to quit, retire, but you carried on going? Just like Beckham in 98 when he got sent off in the World Cup and got loads of abuse not for me alan you had your terrible injuries which might have worried you a little bit uh, definitely worried me yeah um the first one not so much but then the second and third one without doubt um i had to change my game lost a yard of pace so yeah i mean but there was never there was never ever a time when i thought i'm done here i always wanted to play till the end i mean the only time i made a i went back on a U turn. i said i was going to retire when i was 34, I think, in 2004, five, I said that was going to be my last season. But then Graham soon has persuaded me to stay on for another year. But nah, it, it never got that bad that I thought I was ever going to retire because of injuries or whatever it was. No, no I certainly didn't. Um, Mike might be different again here. No, but again with your injuries, probably. Mike, yeah, you? probably. Injuries, Which you, but... you, you had to. I mean, you finished your career relatively early. How old were you when you finished? Uh, I was when I probably played my last game. I think it was twenty nine. But that's I mean that's official. Young. That's young. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. It was. It was, it was, it was I mean, I, I think for me, I just came to the realization that my body couldn't do do it anymore. Like Alan said, now the aches and the pains and all that sort of thing. I've spoke about my time at Villa. Obviously, it, it wasn't great, but you know, I don't have anything against Villa. I want them to do well. The fans. Were, were great with me at times so but it's just you, you, I sort of fell out of love with what came with football you know all the the media side of things and the the people trying to be a mate just for the wrong reasons that that side of thing but I never wanted to retire no never wanted to give up um Ewan hi guys my question is in commentary how is it decided when the co-commentator picks the man of the match? In European games, I've noticed that sometimes the British broadcasters will decide, while other times they don't. Are there any conditions in picking the man of the match? And has Alan ever given a man of the match that he's regretted after? <laughs> um, you're the only one of us that really has ever done that. Um, Alan, it is a funny thing that the co-commentator gets to decide who the man of the match is, isn't it? it yeah, must, it's also quite difficult because you're so focused on you know everything Absolutely. that's going on, what you're going to say, you suddenly go, Christ, I got to pick a man of the match. Is that is that how it is? Or yeah, I, that, I totally that way, Gary, because you're that focused on systems and what they're doing and springing substitutes on and what who's doing what and what have you. So it's yeah, you sometimes. So I mean, sometimes it's it's blindingly obvious that if someone scores a hat trick then that's that's who you but then when it's a really tight intense game and it's there's there's like four or five can uh, can get it then it becomes a little bit more difficult you've got to give your decision with about i don't know two or three minutes to uh, to go uh, i think i did one i did one at uh, wolves at man united i think it was man united wolves maybe a year or two ago and I gave it. I gave it to a Wolves, a Wolves defender. In about a minute later, he scored a fucking own goal. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> "Did you take it off him?" Oh, I couldn't. How can you take it off someone? He's just going to try and be as polite as you can. I'm thinking, "Oh no, but yeah." yeah. It's like, Commentators curse. So, they absolutely, call it, that's, that's, what it, that's how that, it that, works. That, yeah, that's yeah. going to happen. But that, yeah, I wonder who decided that. And originally, somebody somebody went. Yeah. There's going to be a man of the match award, and the co-commentator is going to decide, to decide who it is. It, yes, yes, I have no idea how that started. Yeah, yeah. One Me question either. I have: Why did they do it like five minutes before the game's up? Like the co-commentator takes you to the break, or takes you to the studio, mm. or to the like. It can just wait until the game's about to end. Do you know what I mean? Why well, do they what, give themselves five minutes? I think what the well. 
my guess is what they want to do is because they then want to get the man of the match to do an interview, they then have to speak to the press officer before you can get that interview. You then, they then like to announce it some grounds on the uh, on the tannoy. So, so, so yeah, for for all of those uh, for all, all of those reasons, I think so. Probably because you can get an interview after the game. And I think also they, I think they like to announce it in the ground, don't they? Right. Yeah. just before the final whistle, whoever's yeah. won the man of the match. What about games where there's not... a? I mean, there's commentators, obviously, in all the games because mm. we have them on Match of the Day, but they don't have co-commentators. And I know it's not the com- the commentators that pick the man of the match. And there is man of the match for every game now. Mm. I wonder who picks them in those, on those days. <laughs> yeah, but in the ones... I think that it's the ones that where there's just a commentator... Is probably not so much a big game, and it's not on TV because it, 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 they would have it's a core yeah. commentator if it's on a Correct, TV. Yeah. So I would I would guess that um, it's not so much it's that important when it's just a commentator and not a core commentator. When I played, it was just picked by the club, and um, you'd only get man of the match awards for home games. Well, let's put it this way. The home player would always win it, even if you lost three nil. One of your players would get the man of the match award. <laughs> yeah. And I remember at Spurs, no one wanted it because that meant you had to go and meet the sponsors in a in a lounge after and hang around forever and sign millions of autographs. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, you had, yeah. You remember, was it like that with you <laughs> yeah, as well? That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> that's same, yeah. Oh, how times that, yeah. have changed. <laughs> yeah. to, um, Oh, while we're on the subject of commentators, that takes us nicely. It's all it's all flowing so sweetly today. Um, Pab asks, start, bench, sell. John Motson, Barry Davis, Brian Moore. Love the oh. podcast. Greetings from California. Thank you very much, Pab. Well, you're the you're the, you're going to have to answer this one because Micah Micah wasn't around in what what probably two of those were you? Yeah. Do you remember Brian Moore, Micah at all? No. It was ITV's uh, football co- brilliant. Actually, they're all brilliant, and and actually, I know how um, how competitive and slightly insecure commentators are. So I'm yeah. going to swerve this one. <laughs> uh, um, oh, interesting! <laughs> With the shoes on the other foot. <laughs> interesting. You want me to do it all the time, but you've right. bottled okay. it. Okay, I'll go. Um, Barry Davis start. John Motson bench. It's all per. It's like it's a very personal thing, isn't it? Kind of, Brian Brian Moore because he was ITV and not BBC, so he can go. <laughs> you should read out the same statement I I read out the other day when I wouldn't do it. Well, the truth is Barry Davis is the only one alive, and he lives around the corner from me, so I'm definitely going to start with with Barry Davis. I'll get no comeback from anyone else. Uh, fantastic it's actually somebody came to me last night at um, you know sometimes you have people who've bought an auction item they come into match of the day and mm. they get a little tour and watch the program yeah um, we had um, four guys last night and one of them said oh, I love the podcast I've, I've, I've got one I've got one for you and he said let, let, let me remember who it was he said it was uh, Sir Alex Ferguson Pep Guardiola Bobby Robson Ooh. Oh, and I thought to myself, right, I don't, I would never want to, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't possibly get rid of Bobby Robson. I, I just wouldn't. So I think I'd go Pep Guardiola, Bobby Robson, and then Sir Alex Ferguson because I never got in with him anyway. So I don't care what <laughs> yeah. he thinks. Oh, <laughs> yeah. he never got on good, with the great Sir Alex Ferguson. No, no, he's had a few jibes at me over the years. Yeah. Yeah. He was a bit anti-BBC, I think, but anyway. Um, One from uh, David Hill. Hello, Gary, Alan and Big Meeks. Really enjoying the podcast. Thank you. Who do you think has been the best English manager never to be given the England job? Well, that'd be Brian Clough, wouldn't it? Have to say that. We're all in agreement, yeah. Yeah, Brian Clough. Clough. Well, that was easy. Easy, yeah. Uh, Yeah. Um, Spencer Comer, during your careers, is there any clubs you wouldn't play for? If so, which club and why? I know what your answer is, Alan. <laughs> I got hammered for my comment about Roker Park. I bet you did. <laughs> I was only uh, telling the truth. Um, yeah, because of just because of where you are, where you're born, and who you support, and all that. You couldn't, you couldn't play for Sunderland. Yeah. Well, I turned down. 
Brian Clough, our, our previous um, answer. Um, yeah. Because it was one of the reasons was you can't play for Forest when you're a Leicester lad. <laughs> you, Micah? Wow. Um, no, I would have played for anyone. I've, t- I've, I've, I've told you that Brian Clough tried to sign me. Ooh. Do tell. For those that perhaps haven't heard this story, I was. Um, it was the end of the season. Uh, it was the season where uh, my last season at Barcelona, and I, I knew I had to move because obviously um, Cruyff came in and he, you know, messed me about. Talked about that. So, um, and he wanted his own foreign players. Uh, perfectly understandable. Um, so I was obviously going to go somewhere, and had a bit of interest from various places, and. Um, it was one of those post-season tours with England and we had a game in, I think it was like Sweden or Denmark, somewhere like that. I think it was Denmark. And I was rooming with Peter Shilton, as I always did. And I was actually on the loo. Um, most of my good stories about when I'm having a poo. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, you are full and, of shit. Uh, and, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, the phone, and the phone went in the room and I, I heard... Peter Shilton answer it and I thought Peter Shilton was the most confident bloke ever you know really you know really confident stuff and then but he sounded like he was a little bit in awe of whoever was on the phone I thought I wonder who he's talking to on the phone so and then I heard him say um, um, uh, Gary's on the loo um, hang on a minute so and then he shouted at me so I, I came in and um, Peter Shilton put his hand over the mouthpiece of the phone and he went it's Brian Clough and I thought, oh shit, right, okay, mm-hmm. blimey. So I walk over and um, picked up the phone and, I went, and he went, young man, have you washed your hands? And I went, <laughs> yeah, 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 yes I, yes, I have, Mr. Clough. And he went, call me Brian. I said, okay, um, tell me, are you signed, sealed and delivered? And I went, well, no, not yet. I said, I've got options. Um, I've got options, but nothing nothing confirmed yet. So he went, would you consider coming back to England? I said, well, yes, I've definitely not ruled, ruled that out at all. Would you consider coming to Nottingham Forest? I went, no, not really. Uh, why not? I said, well, you know, if I, and I, I got a bit tongue tied, and I said, well, you know, if I come back to you know English football, I'd, it'd have to be to one of the you know the big clubs. He, I, I, Peter Shilton buried his head in, under his <laughs> under his pillow at this point, and um, he said, Nottingham Forest is a big club. There's only Liverpool won more than us in the last ten years. I said, well, I'm I'm perfectly aware of your record, Brian. I said, I'm, I, it's you know it's it's incredible what what you've achieved, but. <laughs> You know, when I say a big club, I, you know, you know what I mean. One of the big grounds, one of the big places, London, etc. Um, if you understand me, he went, no, I don't. Call me Mr. Clough and hung up. <laughs> and hung up on you. <laughs> and hung up. Never, yeah. Brilliant. Never heard from him again, understandably so. Um, Blake Kester asks, with the season coming to an end and players thinking of their holidays, which other players have you... Or would you go on holiday with? I'm sure Meeks has a story. Uh, the best podcast by far. Well, high praise. Keep up the good work. Um, ooh, yes. <laughs> Who would you want to go on holiday with? Ooh. I'd like to go on holiday with you too. That'd be nice. <laughs> we could do a podcast every day. It depends what sort of holiday though, because I feel well, like fucking, after two a days... fucking saga holiday for Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Spring chicken there, uh, sure. Um, yeah. Ooh. Players you, you would want to go with. I don't think I could have coped with um, going away with Gaza. And uh, let me tell you, by the way, um, we have um, recorded um, an episode with Gaza. That might turn into two episodes. It was absolutely hilarious <laughs> and brilliant. And he was in fantastic form. And we look forward to... Uh, to sharing that with you. We're going to probably do it between the end of the season and the Euros. Um, I think you'll love it. And um, I was ill with laughter. Oh, oh goodness me. I haven't crying. laughed like that for a long time. Some great stories. Yeah. It was 90 minutes of hilarity um, <laughs> and, and not just the fact that he can't get anywhere near saying Micah correctly. <laughs> <laughs> but it won't spoil. No spoilers. No spoilers. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no spoilers. Yeah. 
Um, I would have liked to go to Vegas with Big Meeks just oh! for a long weekend. Oh! <laughs> back in the days, if I t- back in my 20, 19, 20, 21 days, that's when I was in my prime. The prime of partying. The prime of partying. <laughs> <laughs> who, who would you have wanted to go away with? Mario Balotelli? No, because Balotelli, if you go with Balotelli, he's too famous. You get caught when you with Balotelli. You know, you can't be sneaking and, you know, you can't be getting... <laughs> sneaking. He, he's too loud and he gets caught too much. Yeah, you've got to go with people who, you know, know how to move correctly on a night night out so you don't get caught. <laughs> and I'm not naming any players because I don't want to incriminate any of my former teammates. But we had some great time. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I'm reminiscing about it now. So are you sweating? The, the Heaney Drive. Yeah. Los Angeles. Oh, my God. <laughs> Party. I, re- I think you should leave it there, me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where um, did it all go wrong? Um, which brings me perfectly to a question about George Best. Uh, Benjamin Smith, as a long-time listener, I don't think I've ever heard any of you mention George Best. Uh, what do you think of him as a player, and what if George Best had played for England? Um, well, he was, of course, from Northern Ireland. So, um, I mean, you wouldn't have seen him play, Micah. Um, Alan, did you, did you catch him at all? Probably can't remember. I'm probably the only one old enough yeah. to remember. He... and. He was on, but he was, I mean, he was so brilliantly gifted, um, wide player most of the time, ghosted by people as though they were they were standing still. And the bits, some of the bits um, that I saw, Gaz, in terms of, uh, you know, when you're on about the pitches and the dribbling and how he went past players and how players could side you down there. I mean, he made it look so easy on the bits that I saw. Yeah, I mean, it's all so difficult with different eras, but, he, you know, if any conversation about the best um, sort of, British player ever, he'd have to be right in it, wouldn't he? he was he was oh. he was so good. Him and and Bobby Charlton would probably be the other one, both in the same team, mm. Busby Babes. Yeah, um, but yeah, unbelievable talent. I, I I met him a few times. Um, in, in fact, they did the um, the FIFA Best One Hundred or something, where they hundred all time. Um, best players. This is just me trying to give myself a mention of getting in the top hundred. But um, I was, I was. There were a few um, kind of British players there, and I was there. Michael Owen was there, and George Best was um, kind of latter stages of his life, really. And he was, he, he was drinking so much that I remember when we walked in for the presentation, Michael Owen was on one side of him, I was on the other, tr- basically holding him up. Um, which 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 felt a bit Shame. you know obviously sad and we all know, yeah. you know what happened to him but um, he was a lovely lovely man I mean he he really was um, and obviously had his you know alcoholic problems but and, and health issues but but what a footballer what a footballer yeah what a talent yeah yeah Dave Goodham as a former regional journalist what's been the biggest row you have ever had with a journalist. And what has been the biggest lie you have read about yourself in the media? Cool, been a few of those. Um, I don't, you don't, I don't, I can't remember really having any rows with. Jer- There's a few times I've read stories where you know that had um, piss you off. That that still goes to this day, <laughs> usually in the Daily Mail. Um, but um, I can't remember confronting journalists I, I mean we used to get on quite well with them um, in the England days that I played they were always on the trip you used to fly with them travel with them yeah you used to yeah, go on the same on the trips. plane and everything else yeah. didn't they yeah it used to be a right pain in the arse waiting for the because they had to all file their reports and you were sat there on the plane waiting for them to to do all that and then get back on and so yeah it was it was very different back then wasn't it? There were certainly better relationship ships yeah well, they were always the same journalists, weren't they, as well? Each paper had their designated journalists and they'd follow us, you know, they'd, they'd be around and you interview them and, or they'd interview us, I should say. But they were, yeah, they're, they're, you got to know them quite well. Mm. Um, and and generally, like, as, when we spoke to Henry Winter the other day, generally they, you know, they're, they're yeah. decent, decent people. It was always the front of the paper that you had to worry about rather than the, necessarily the sports journalists, I think. <laughs> What are you laughing, Micah? No comment from Micah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> Last question from Jordan Hines. Can all three of you speak about the most memorable or favourite member of the coaching staff they experienced whilst at their clubs, etc.? Micah, I'm thinking Chappie for you. Who's Chappie? Oh, Les Chapman. Ah, yes. He, yeah. Yes, he was the kit man at Man City for as long as I can remember, must be 20, 20, he's left now, but he was just a brilliant bridge between the managers, the, the, like the medical staff and, mm. and the players as well. You know, somebody who just links it all together and he would be totally honest with you as well. Like if he said, he, like if he played rubbish, he would tell you he'd play rubbish. He was none of that sugar coating nonsense and, he would stay out longer if he needed, you know, because some kit men want to be done by two, three o'clock, don't they? But he would stay and he wouldn't moan. He would leave kit, say I could take kit. He was just an absolute diamond of a of a blow, uh, of a fella. Less chap, but at Man City. You build up, certainly I did anyway, great relationships with the kit men, um, with the physios. Um, in all my clubs, Southampton, Blackburn, and, and Newcastle, um, the kit men were amazing. The physios were great, and and even you know even the I think even like the assistant managers have to be. Yeah. You have to have such a good relationship. I mean, Dennis Rolfe was beginning it with Chris Nicholl at Southampton. Then we had Ray Harford and Tony Parks at Blackburn. We had Terry McDermott and Derek Fazakli and, and John Carver throughout the years at, at Newcastle. So I think that's such a hugely important role. Yeah, it, it really is, isn't it? The the, the number two. Yeah, you know, yeah. You know, the, the kind of that liaison. They're kind of the good cop against yeah, exactly. the manager's yeah. bad yeah. cop, aren't they? A, yeah. a lot of the time. I always had good relationships with the, the physios because they're the ones that got me out of training. <laughs> uh, I'll give a mention to Fred Street because I, mean, yeah, I bumped I into him Fred. a few months ago. I hadn't seen him for donkey's years and he's he's still going strong. Um, he's close to 90 or so now. Wow. But um, he was England's physio for forever um, and just a lovely, lovely guy. And um, And like most players, always relied on the physio to to get you out there. Um, great way <laughs> yeah. to finish. Um, that's it for our question and answer episode. Don't forget the Gaza one will be coming to you in a, oh, a couple of weeks, probably. Um, you'll love that. But um, for now, goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. <laughs>